Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in today. I believe that God's gonna use his word once again to encourage your heart in a special way. If you wanna know more about Shelter Cove, check us out at sheltercovelive.com. But again, I pray that God uses this message to encourage your heart in a special way today. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Jeremy, one of the pastors here at Shelter Cove. And if this is your first time joining us, I just wanna say welcome. So glad that you're tuning in. And before we dive into the message today, uh, I just wanna give a shout out to the teachers, parents, students, principals, administrators. I know it has been a crazy week if you live in the Modesto area. And boy, for some of you, it's just been a victory to be able to make it through the week. So we are praying for better days ahead. And in fact, I wanna just pray for you right now. If you're somebody involved in the school system, again, a parent, student, teacher, principal, or maybe you've just had a rough week. I just wanna pray for you and pray that God would use today's message to encourage your heart, to inspire your life in a powerful way. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we are blessed to be able to gather together online. And for those of my friends that have had a rough week, a challenging week, a discouraging week, God, thank you that you have the ability to pick us up and launch us forward in a new direction. So God, we pray for your strength. We pray for your perspective. And God, more than anything, we pray for your peace that surpasses understanding. God, be with us today as we open your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, hey, if you have a Bible, meet me in Luke chapter 15. Luke 15 is where we're gonna be today. We're talking about vision today, where God's leading us as we enter the future. But I also wanna let you know, next week we're starting a brand new three-week series. We've never done this series before. It's called At The Movies. And what we're doing is we're looking at three different movies and we're looking at biblical themes. We're looking at truth. We're identifying lies in the midst of these movies. And uh, we're gonna be looking at Sea Biscuit. We're gonna be looking at The Dark Knight. And then we're also looking at one of my favorite movies, Remember the Titans. In fact, we're gathering together out on the lawn that Friday night, Labor Day weekend. It's gonna be great. Uh, check it out. But this is a great series for you to invite your friends to that don't yet know Jesus Christ. So encourage them uh, to join us online, but even better, bring them to one of our services out on the lawn, Saturday nights at seven, Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. It's gonna be absolutely awesome. Hey, I'm super stoked for the message today uh, because really this is this is vision we're talking about. It's, it's a picture of the future. This is a vision for our church, but not just our church. It's a vision for you personally uh, as a follower of Jesus Christ. Let me set the stage of Luke chapter 15. Jesus is surrounded with Pharisees. He's surrounded with teachers of the law and they're grumbling, they're, they're criticizing Jesus because Jesus has developed this reputation of being a friend of sinners. And Jesus is gonna share three different parables, which are stories in Luke 15. He's talking about the, the 99 sheep, he's talking about the, the nine coins, and he's talking about the one son and what he's willing to do for the one the one that wanders off and the one that's lost. Luke 15, these are the words of Jesus. This is what it says in verse one. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Let me just pause there just for a moment. Don't ever worry about being criticized for doing the right thing. In fact, don't ever Take criticism from somebody that you wouldn't take advice from. Picking it up in verse three. So he told them this parable. This is Jesus. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Absolutely love that parable of Jesus and there's so many different implications that go with that. Uh, thinking about my life, back when I was 21 years old, my life forever changed. 
Uh, I was growing in my love for the Lord. I started helping out with a youth ministry, and it was uh, an evening Friday night. My friend had set up uh, the youth room with different scary scenes in there of, of car accidents and people that have died, and it really uh, made students think about life after life on this earth. And I remember he just said, hey, Jeremy, can you just pray with people and be willing to talk to them after they walk through this? Because we really want to encourage students to think about eternity. And so I wasn't gifted, I wasn't qualified, but I was available. And I'll never forget, there was this guy named Ryan who was a sophomore. He walked through the whole thing, and I got to sit down with Ryan and talk with Ryan and say, Ryan, what'd you think about it? And Ryan, uh, if you died tonight, do you, do you know that you'd go to heaven? And he said, no. And I said, do you want to know that? And after a long pause, he said, Jeremy, I, I do. And I remember telling him about the love of Jesus and the forgiveness of Jesus and said, hey, do you want to invite the Lord into your heart? And told him how to do that. And he said, yes, I do. I want that. And I was like, are, are you sure? Because I felt like I did something wrong. I'm like, I must have not explained it because this guy was hungry to have Jesus in his life. And I basically tried to talk him out of it. Now, let me just tell you, that doesn't look good on a pastor's resume when you try to talk somebody out of giving their life to the Lord. But we had a great conversation. Ryan gives his life to the Lord. And I look back at my life today. And after myself giving my life to Christ, the second greatest thing that I've ever experienced in my life was God using me to share the gospel and be a part of what God was doing and lead somebody else to Jesus Christ. Today, I say that because we're talking about the one. At that point, Ryan was somebody that was lost, but then he was found. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the one. We're talking about somebody that doesn't yet know Jesus Christ. Now, our mission statement here at Shelter Cove is reaching and raising authentic followers of Jesus. That's who we are, that's what we do. Huge heart for evangelism, huge heart for discipleship. Uh, we absolutely love that. Now our vision, and this is in your notes, is simply this, it's the one. It's the one boy, the one girl, the one man, the one woman that doesn't yet know Jesus Christ. Spiritually speaking, as Luke 15 says, they're, they're lost, they're, they're perishing, they've wandered from God, they, they don't know God. Our vision is the one. Now, here, here's the goal. Our, our goal is to reach the one, to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, who then reaches another one. So we're talking about multiplication. So, so my prayer for you is that God would use you in such a way where you give your life to Jesus Christ, that you grow in such a way and you're learning the scriptures and you're learning about Jesus and you have such a heart for people that don't yet know Christ where, where you lead them to Christ and then they lead somebody to Christ and you're discipling other people and they're leading somebody to Christ. Again, our goal is to reach the one to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. How does that happen? It happens with you. You're discipling them. You're inviting them to your life group, the men's ministry, women's ministry. Maybe they're serving with you. Maybe you're walking them through growth track, which is going to be done digitally very soon. But we have a huge heart to reach somebody, raise them up so they can reach somebody else. That's the heartbeat. That's the vision here at Shelter Cove. That's my prayer for your life. Now, we have to ask ourselves, how do we reach the one? How do we reach the one? And what I want to do today is I want to share with you three principles, uh, ultimately, that are in the life of Jesus that apply to us. If we're going to reach the one, how do we do this with these three principles? But not only that, I want it to be super practical. So if you have your notebooks out, take a bunch of notes, uh, let God speak to your heart, encourage you in your walk with Christ today in a very powerful way. Starting again, how do we reach the one? First of all, principle number one is this. The one becomes our priority. The one becomes our priority. Somebody put that in the chat for me. The one becomes our priority. Notice what happens in verse four. Jesus says, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, does not leave them, uh, the 99 in the open country, and go after the one that's lost until he finds it? Uh, I love this because here's Jesus, uh, of course, in the scriptures, he's referred to as the good shepherd. He calls himself the good shepherd, but he refers to us as sheep. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 53, it says that we are like sheep who have gone astray pursuing our own things. Now, what do we know about sheep? Sheep uh, often wander off. Uh, sheep are not the smartest animals. Once sheep wander off, they have a difficult time 
uh, finding their way back. In fact, it's impossible for them to do that. And so of all the animals that, that we could be uh, demonstrated as in the scripture, in this parable, it's a sheep. Why? Because it, it makes sense. The sheep wandered off and it was lost. Now, I, I have to ask you a question, uh, parents, moms, and dads. Have you ever lost one of your children? Have you, and if you have, is there, if they were a kid, uh, put it in the chat where you lost them, all right? Some of you have parents of teenagers and you're like, I'm hoping I lose some of my kids in this upcoming season. That's not what we're talking about. Now let me confess as you're typing where you lost one of your kids. I've lost my kids a couple different times. Once it was in Target and once it was in Walmart. Now it wasn't for very long. It was only for like two to three hours, right? No, two to three minutes. Two to three minutes is how long they were lost. But here's the crazy thing. If you're a parent, you know what this means. Uh, there are times where our kids wander off and they're lost and we see them there and we're waiting for them to realize that they're missing. We're waiting for them to, to make that response and reaction to, to all of a sudden startle and realize mom's gone, dad's gone, grandparents are gone. But here's the crazy thing. You can watch your kids for several minutes, and there are some of them that will never come to the realization that they've wandered off, that they're lost. And that's the same for us as, as human beings. There are so many of us that, that are spiritually lost, have wandered away from God, and we don't even know it. And yet in the scriptures, we see that, that the one becomes what? Our priority. And I love this because at the end of verse four, this is what it says. It says in a very powerful way, it says, does he not look until he finds it? What does that mean? That means that the good shepherd, Jesus, he doesn't give up on us. And I say that because for you, maybe you've given up on yourself today. Maybe you've given up on God, you've given up on church, you've given up on Christianity. Here's the good news. God never has and he never will give up on you. And so when we have a heart for the one, when the one becomes our priority, we refuse to give up on others. Why? Because the God of this universe has never given up on us. Now let's get super practical just for a moment. How do we get to a point? What are some things that we can do that will help the one, the one that's wandered off, the one that's lost, the one that's living in rebellion to God, how do we help uh, make the one a priority in our life? And I want to share with you three practical ways. Number one is simply this, consistently pray for lost people. Uh, when you gather around the table uh, with your kids, moms and dads, uh, ask your kids to pray by name for kids in their class that don't yet know Jesus. Where, where maybe make a notebook in your Bible, write down people's names every time you open your Bible. So every page of your Bible is filled with names of people that don't know Jesus. As we pray, people become our priority. Don't miss that. And so, in fact, somebody put that in the notes for me. Uh, as we pray, people become our priority. So we have to make sure we're daily praying for lost people. Second of all, strategically connect with the one. Now, I'm gonna offend some of you intentionally right now. Some of you are just way too busy. Some of you, by the time you, you work, your hobbies, uh, all the extracurricular activities, uh, your priorities are all out of whack where you have no time to get connected to the one. And here's what I love about the life of Jesus Christ is that when you look at him, he, he often wasn't in a hurry. He always had time for people. People would say, hey, can you come? Uh, my family members died. Your friend has died, Jesus. And Jesus was like, yeah, yeah, I'll get there. But he always had time to connect with the one. So what do you need to get rid of? What do you need to leave behind so that the lost people in your life become a priority? And then lastly, again, to get super practical, the third thing we need to do is intentionally grow in confidence. If this is going to be a priority, the one, we have to, to grow in our confidence. Now, how do we do that? I believe there's two practical things that we can do. Number one is, is get to know and become familiar with your story. Uh, some people call a, a testimony. It's, it's where you share what God's done and what he's doing in your life, your life before Christ, how you met Christ, and what life is like now after encountering a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But not only that, I wanna encourage you 
to get to know the Romans road. And we're gonna put these verses here on the screen. If you wanna do a screenshot or take a picture with your phone, however you wanna do that, that's fine. But there's five different verses from the book of Romans that are really simple and easy to understand. And I would encourage you to just get these down. First of all is Romans 3.23. It says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, all of us fall short of God's perfect standard. And then Romans 5.8 is the next one where it says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What does that mean? It means that God take, took, takes the initiative through his son, Jesus Christ. And then Romans 6.23, it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What does that mean? That means that salvation cannot be earned, but it is a gift from God. And then you've got Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead, we will be saved. And so that, that's, that's the confidence that we have. If we believe it in our hearts and confess it with our mouth and it's real, we're going to be saved. And then Romans 10, 13 simply says that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. But the first thing that we see is that the one becomes our priority. Why? It's the priority in the life of Jesus. He would leave the 99 and go after the one that's lost, that's distanced, that's spiritually perishing. Now, the second principle that we see is the one becomes our passion. The one becomes our passion. Somebody put that in the little chat for me. The one becomes our passion. And this is what it says in verse five and six. It says, and when he found it, he lays it on its shoulders, rejoicing. And he comes home and calls his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me for I've found my, uh, my one sheep that was lost. I, I, I love this because here's the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, that finds the sheep. And what does he do? He, he puts it on his shoulders. Now, now, this is so important because we can be excited and passionate about so many things. But our greatest passion, the thing we rejoice about the most, should be the things that ultimately excite Jesus Christ. I mean, here's, here's the shepherd, and he puts this sheep on his shoulders. I, I love that, because what does it communicate? It communicates that, that Jesus is the one that rescues us. But not only that, Jesus is the one that secures us. If we're the lamb and he's the shepherd, it means that there is nothing we could ever do to lose our salvation. And here's why. The sheep is not holding on to the shepherd. The shepherd is holding on to the sheep. But, but there's this celebration that takes place. And we celebrate over the craziest things, don't we? I mean, it used to be that we would only celebrate when people graduated from college. Now we go crazy when kids graduate from preschool. Like we have parties and we celebrate when people put on a uniform, even though they win nothing. But what if we celebrated the things that, that Jesus celebrated? What if we celebrated when the one came to know Jesus? That's why here at Shelter Cove, at the end of our services, when people give their lives to Christ, we go crazy. That's why when people get baptized and they come out of the water, it's like the Raiders win the Super Bowl. I mean, it is absolutely exciting and crazy. We throw a party. Why? Because that's our passion. Our passion is the one. We celebrate the things that Jesus celebrates, and that's when lost people come to know Christ. Now, here's the simple reality. We will all fall into one of two categories. We will either be lost or we will be found. And so today, you're in one of those two categories. And my prayer is that if you find that you're the one, you're not walking with Christ, you don't know Christ that again, you would know that Jesus Christ leaves the rest behind to pursue you because he wants to take you back to the flock. How do we maintain this, this passion? How do we, we maintain a passion for the one? I believe that there's three things. Number one, we have to rejoice in what God rejoices in. We have to rejoice in what God rejoices in. I mean, for so many of us, like when we experience something powerful, we want other people to experience it. When we eat a good meal, we're like, you got to go to this restaurant. Or when we see a movie, we're like, you have to see the movie or Disneyland. We're like, you got to go on this ride at Disneyland. Or what if we were so excited because we're experiencing a walk with Jesus Christ and we're like, man, you just got to experience 
what I'm experiencing. I'm experiencing peace. I'm experiencing joy. I'm experiencing forgiveness. You have to experience what I'm experiencing. Why? We rejoice in the things that bring God joy. Second of all, how do we grow and keep our passion alive for the one? We have to live as a new creation. We have to live as a new creation. Now, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17, if anyone, I love that, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. Now, this doesn't change just overnight. It's, it's a change where God gives us a brand new heart and changes us from the inside out. Now, it's, it's four words is what I would call it. It's a lifelong process, daily progress. Somebody put that in the chat. Lifelong process, daily progress. That's what transformation looks like. You know, just recently I, I saw a friend that got a brand new car and I was, I was looking at it and boy, the, the tires look brand new. The paint job, of course, is new. You look under the hood, the hood's new and boy, you go inside the car and the, the mats are new. It even smells new. And what happens? You get to a point where like, I want what you have. I, I, that, the, I want what to have. It's brand new. It's attractive. We should live as new creations where people look at our lives. And they're saying, man, I, I want what you have. Why? Because we're living with passion because we just want the one to come to know Jesus. But not only are we living as a new creation, we are embracing our Christ-like identity. That's the third thing that we do. We embrace our Christ-like identity. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, what does Paul go on and say? Paul goes on and says that, that Jesus Christ has reconciled people to God. And he's saying, now you are Christ's ambassadors, where God's going to be making his plea to the world through you guys. And I can't think of a greater identity than to be a, an ambassador of Jesus Christ, a representative of Jesus Christ. I mean, kings... Back when this was going on, they would, would send representatives, uh, ambassadors to, to do their work through them. And yet, where are we? We are an ambassador of Jesus Christ, where Christ, Christ is doing His work through Christians because we have embraced our Christ-like identity. Don't miss this. Our vision is about the one. How does that happen well, the one becomes our priority, our greatest priority. Not only that, the one becomes our passion. <laughs> but thirdly, the one becomes our purpose. Why? Because it's, it's the purpose of Jesus. Verse 7 puts it this way. It says, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents then over 99 that need not repentance. I, I, I love this. this. This reminds us of the purpose. And again, we see the joy, 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 joy that's happening, not just on earth and the party that's taking place, but the joy that's taking place in heaven with the angels. Why? Because of the one. The lost boy, the lost girl, the lost man, the lost woman, the repents and is rescued by Jesus Christ. That becomes our purpose. Now let me just lovingly challenge you in just a special way, because I think for some of us, our tendency might be to think, well, what about the 99? What about the nine coins? What about the brother that never left his father, never ran away, and indulged in a life of, of rebellion and, and sin. What about, what about us? And I just want to encourage you in a loving way today that, that the call to Christ, the call to Christianity, the call to what I believe is a healthy church is that we are required to die to ourselves every day. And our focus changes. It's no longer about us. It is all about God and it's all about others. In fact, our calling in life, our greatest purpose in life, don't miss this, is to worship God. That's why we were created. And so when we are reaching people, when we are reaching the one, what are we creating? We are creating other worshipers. We are allowing 
the creation to worship the creator. People are being able to experience what they were created to do. In fact, I love what John Piper says. He puts it this way. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exists because worship doesn't. And so we have to see ourselves as reaching the one ultimately as an act of worship. Why? Because the one becomes our purpose. It's why we're here. Luke chapter 19, Jesus is hanging out with uh, the people and he's walking along the road and he sees this man, uh, a despised tax collector. His name was Zacchaeus. And he looks at him and he says, come down from that tree, Zacchaeus. I'm eating at your house today. I love that. He gives himself an invitation to go over to somebody else's house and eat with them. You should try that sometime, by the way, especially if they're a good cook. But Jesus does that. And then later in Luke uh, chapter 19, 10, he says, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost, the purpose of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, we become people that are focused on others. That was the life of Jesus Christ. He was constantly aware of his surroundings, constantly focused on others. Now, if you've ever been to Hollywood or Beverly Hills, you've probably been at a place where you're constantly looking for movie stars and trying to be aware of, of anybody that's a celebrity that you can possibly see. Constantly aware of people, constantly aware of your surroundings. Well, what if we did that just a little bit differently? What if we are, we're so aware of our surroundings and so aware of people that we began to see people with not just the, the heart of Jesus, not just the mind of Jesus, but the eyes of Jesus. Thinking, you know, that could be one. That could be somebody that doesn't know the Lord. That could be somebody that has walked away from the Lord. What, what if we ultimately lived a life that focused on people? That was the life of the Apostle Paul. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 he says, you know what, to, to the Jews, I became a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law to win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became like one outside the law to win those outside the law. To the weak, I became the weak to win the weak. And then he goes on and says this. He says, I've become all things to all people that I might win some. And he says, I've done this all for the sake of the gospel. Friends, my, my prayer for our church, my prayer for you, my prayer for myself is that we would be a church about the one. Why? Because Jesus is about the one. The one. Lost boy, lost girl, lost man, lost woman, a neighbor, a friend, a coworker, whoever it is, somebody we go to school with, would become our focus. Why? Because the one has become our priority. The one has become our passion. But not only that, the one has become our purpose. Church, in the best way that we know how, let's be a church that's about the one. I mean, that's why we do so much of what we do. That's why we're doing this series at the movies coming up so you can be about the one and bring your friends. That's why we do our big Christmas events. That's why we did this big car rally thing this last week for our whole community. That's why we do so much of what we do. It's for the one. Let's be about the one. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. And I pray in a special way that you would change our hearts and change our perspective in such a way that we would be burdened for the people in our lives that don't yet know Jesus Christ. That you would use us and where our hearts need to change, change our hearts. Where our thinking needs to change, change our thinking. Where our priorities need to change, change our priorities. Because at the end of the day, we just want to have the heart of Jesus, the mind of Jesus, and the eyes of Jesus. Maybe you're here and maybe you're listening today and you realize that you don't yet have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In other words, you realize that, that you're the one. You have no idea how 
you've gotten to where you're at, you have no idea where you're going to spend eternity. But know this, the same way that that shepherd left the 99 to chase after the one, he is chasing after you today. He loves you. The reason why he came into this world and shed his blood on the cross and rose three days later was to die for you that you may have life and have it to the full and to be right with God. And if that's your desire today is to to be rescued by the shepherd, which is to be rescued by Jesus, Just let Jesus know right now in the best way that you can that you you receive Him. There's not a special prayer. There's not special words. It's it's a heart that surrenders. It's It's a heart that submits. It's a heart that realizes that they are a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. And boy, if if that's you, just let Jesus know right now. God, for my brothers and sisters today that that are now walking with you for the first time, God, would you allow yourself to be real and tangible in ways that only you can. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Boy, if you gave your life to Jesus Christ, we are so proud of you. Here's a number on the screen please shoot us a text message. We'd love to celebrate with you. We'd love to get you connected and help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. And again, for those of you that are saved and you're walking with the Lord, my prayer for you is the same prayer that I have for myself, is that we would follow in the footsteps of Jesus and that we would be a people that are ultimately about the one.